So good morning. Good morning. Okay, so I'm Dr. Cindy Miller, President of the World Affairs Council, and on behalf of uh, Dr. Regina Park, the Chair of Great Decisions, and the rest of the Council, welcome to another Great Decisions <coughs> session. Uh, I'd like you to remind you to silence your cell phones, and also, uh, you know, new venue, but you can still bring food like you did yet last time, if you desire. We, we just have tables out. Of course, we don't have a kitchen, so anything out, we just need to use up that day, for those of you who like to bring food. Now, uh, for those new to these programs, Great Decisions is the largest grassroots input on matters of international relations and foreign policy in the world. Uh, during the year, world affairs across the country uh, hold sessions like these to provide you the opportunity to influence American foreign policy decisions, both with your ballots and also by educating yourselves on critical issues of world affairs. Uh, the link to the online ballot uh, you can fill out after the session is in your program. The Council would like to thank the Norfolk Commission of the Arts and Humanities for a generous grant in support of Great Decisions, and Dr. David Reselman and Norfolk Academy for hosting the event. Uh, next week, we'll be back in the Price Auditorium, which is across the courtyard. Uh, and we'd also like to thank our corporate sponsors <laughs> listed in your program which includes Penrod, Bay Diesel, and SunTrust Bank. For their support, they have demonstrated a commitment to the community, education, and the global standing of Hampton Roads. And, uh, and now, with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Carp to introduce our speaker. Good morning again. Um, I, I'm not sure whether everybody heard what uh, Dr. Lynch said in one sentence. Russia can obviously exist in the same temporal space, but that they are a long way away from sharing the same social and political and cultural space. And I think this is a very important opening statement, and to a large extent, it actually summarizes Dr. Lynch's work over three decades, because he's not just your run-of-the-mill political scientist. If you will pick up his, any of his books, we can't hear. If you pick up any of his books or articles, I said earlier that he's not a run-of-the-mill political scientist. If you pick up any of his books or articles, you will be impressed by the depths of his understanding of Russia, both in historical terms and in contemporary terms, by his great respect for Russian culture, by his curiosity to find out how US-Russian relations can develop, what the limitations are, by the insecurities that both sides, I think, share when they, whenever they get close to each other, and how, though international interdependence compels them to figure out some of the most pressing international problems together. Professor Lynch is a professor of government at the University of Virginia. Um, as you will, I'm sure, recognize, um, he is a fantastic speaker. Um, his lectures are extremely popular. Uh, he has won teaching awards at the University of Virginia. He's been invited to be a fellow at institutes and universities in Berlin, in Shanghai, in Geneva, and in Paris. He has published quite a number of books and articles that have been translated into several languages. He has been an advisor to governments, to institutes, to international um, non-governmental organizations. He is a, an incredibly well-rounded scholar in the old-fashioned kind of way, if I may say so, which gets me back to my earlier remarks, that he is not a, what you might call, a specialist or an expert. He is a scholar. He understands his subject and he appreciates the opportunities and the difficulties of studying Russia. So I think you're in for a treat and I would like to welcome Dr. Alan Lynch to the podium.
Affairs Council of Greater, the World Affairs Council, let me try it again, the World Affairs Council of the Greater Hampton Roads, friends and colleagues, thank you for this gracious invitation. Uh, as uh, Regina and Cindy have already noted, um, I wrote this year's article in the Great Decisions series volume on Russia's foreign policy. Um, rather than summarizing that article, which would likely be repetitive, it would also and it would also result in an overly broad overview, I believe, of the topic. Allow me, if you will, rather to hone in on one aspect of the subject, one that I think is explicitly or implicitly at the heart, not just of American foreign policy, but also of a lot of our domestic politics as well. And that is the very simple question, should we fear Russia? Let me review the case in the affirmative. And it's a case that will probably be pretty familiar to most in this audience. Exhibit A, in 2008, the Russians fought a brutal and bloody five-day war in Georgia, dismantled the Georgian army, and in the process halted that country's movement toward eventual admission into the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Six years later, in March of 2014, in an extremely efficiently executed operation, Russian forces, mainly already based in Crimea, seized control of the peninsula, which was under Ukrainian sovereignty, recognized as such by the United Nations and by Russia and the United States in a separate treaty, the treaty that provided in 1994 for Ukraine to return all of the nuclear weapons materials located on its territory to Russia, annex that territory to Russia, and then, in an attempt to repeat the operation in far eastern Ukraine, help instigate a revolt that continues in one form or another to the present day, that has resulted in at least 10,000 deaths, several million refugees, and the perpetuation of instability throughout much of uh, post-Soviet East Central Europe. Exhibit C, at the end of September 2015, the Russian air and naval forces intervened dramatically in the Syrian civil war, ultimately with fairly decisive results, allowing not just for the survival of the brutal authoritarian dictatorship of Bashar al-Assad, but even for it's uh, taking back of territory that had previously been lost to various uh, rebel groups, including the city of Aleppo in the north. Exhibit D, we're all aware, over more than 15 years, of a series of premature deaths of inconvenient politicians, journalists, lawyers, and others opposed to Putin. Friends of Putin, it seems, never die premature deaths. <laughs> Exhibit E. Manipulated elections at home, time and again, in spite of Putin's undoubted popularity throughout much of Russia. And not uh, uh, least, of course, a very strong circumstantial case that Russian authorities, either directly or through deniable intermediaries, interfered in the 2016 U.S. presidential elections. The aim, well, according to three leading U.S. intelligence agencies, the FBI, the CIA, and the National Security Agency, it was in order to help elect Donald Trump. Two of those agencies, the CIA and the FBI, expressed that opinion with, quote, a high degree of confidence. The NSA expressed that opinion with, quote, moderate confidence. In spook speak, moderate confidence means we could well be wrong. 
I'll come back to that. Let me just see if I can secure this microphone so it doesn't keep falling. I have a little bit of a cold, as you can tell, but it's like what Mark Twain said about Wagner's music. It's uh, not as bad as it sounds. <laughs> <laughs> that was uh, far from being the only such uh, intervention in Western electoral processes. Just to give examples that are a matter of public record, about two years ago, a major Russian bank close to the Russian government lent the National Front in France, Marine Le Pen's far-right organic nationalist party, uh, $6 million. Because no, other French, no French bank would lend them money. So they went to Russia, and Russia has an interest in sowing disunion into the European Union, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So these are not necessarily isolated cases. And I could go on. Yet consider the following evidence as well. In 2001, Vladimir Putin made Russia the single most important ally of the United States after the September 11th attacks in the war in Afghanistan against the Taliban and Al-Qaeda, opening up Russian airspace to American military overflights from NATO Europe, ordering the cooperation of Russian intelligence authorities with U.S. authorities on everything connected to Afghanistan, accelerating the delivery of massive amounts of weaponry across the old Soviet border into Afghanistan, where the Russians still had several military bases, and acquiescing in the establishment of several key American military bases in former Soviet territory, in Kazakhstan, in Uzbekistan, in Tajikistan, on the Afghan border, without which the U.S. could not have efficiently uh, undertaken that operation. And you can see in the body language of the press conference in Crawford, Texas, November 15, 2001. They believe they've done it. They've destroyed the Taliban. They've uprooted Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. They did it together, and by the way, with no more than 420 U.S. Special Operations Forces in Afghanistan at any one time. All armed with suitcases carrying one of two things. Either remote laser finders, to guide bombers to their targets, or wads of $100 bills to pay off war loans, right? And you can see Putin believes. He's one too. Not only he believes, this is my judgment, has he been able, by working with the United States, a very controversial position in Russian politics at the time, by the way. He was almost alone in arguing to align Russia with Washington in 2001. Not only did the alliance rid Russia of a threat it could not rid itself of alone, the Taliban, a radical jihadist regime on the old Soviet border, but he believed more broadly it could be the basis of a global partnership with the United States. That would fail. I'll come back to the reasons why not just that attempt <clears throat> failed, but every attempt since the early 1990s at forging a stable American-Russian partnership has failed. But the effort was made, and for a time, it appeared to succeed. When I show my students these images, and then I play the press conference, they can't believe that there ever was such a time. Remember, most of my students were born only a few years before that. In 2010, In the immediate aftermath of the Obama Reset Summit in Moscow, one of the results, very little talked about in the United States, is that Putin agreed to expand dramatically the NATO transportation network going through Russian territory to allow the US and its NATO allies to supply their forces in and outside of Afghanistan. This had been established already in 2001. In 2010, it was expanded in two ways. First, now Putin allowed US aircraft, NATO aircraft, to convey lethal military equipment, weaponry, not just supplies, non-lethal supplies. Secondly, they dramatically expanded a railroad network in the upper left from Riga, Latvia on the Baltic Sea 
through many hundreds of miles of Russian territory, Central Asian territory, to the borders of Afghanistan. That existed until 2015. Almost never mentioned in public sources in the United States. And to give you an example of its importance, uh, now, is this, the, is this what I can use to, um, is there, no? Okay. What you'll just see is this. Within a year, Deliveries of contain, truck containers along this railroad went from fewer than 500 a month to 3,000 a month. And that continued every year through 2015. NATO could not have executed its military operations in Afghanistan halfway as efficiently as it did without that car or through Russian territory. Again, done with Russian agreement. During the same period of time, 2010, 2015. This is uh, during the negotiations over how to contain, if possible, Iran's nuclear weapons ambitions. The Russians actually made several serious efforts to move those negotiations substantively forward. Again, not well covered in the United States, but serious nevertheless. Number one, on two occasions, the Russians offered to receive from the Iranians their highly enriched uranium, transport it to Russian territory, denature it to the point where it could not be used for military purposes, and then return it to the Iranians. On two occasions, this would have been a way to ensure that Iran has a nuclear program that cannot be used for military purposes. But on both occasions, the Iranians refused. Why? Well, the Iranians are as allergic toward Russian influence as they are to American. Remember, in 1907, the British and the Rus and Russians divided Iran 50-50 into spheres of influence. On the eve of the First World War, the bodyguard of the Shah of Iran was 200 Russian Cossacks. So, it's not just the great Satan of the United States that the Iranians are concerned about. They considered any foreign influence to be an infringement upon their sovereignty. Nevertheless, the Russians did make the effort. Secondly, for five years, the Russians postponed the delivery of their most advanced surface-to-air uh, missile system to the Iranians under contract, worth several billions of dollars. Essentially, as a concession to the Americans to provide, in effect, a negative incentive to the Iranians pending the development of the negotiations. Again, each of these stories complicate the narrative of a kind of atavistic, reflexive Russian opposition to everything the United States does. In September 2013, Putin, in effect, saved President Obama from an ill-prepared military strike against Syria, for which there were no follow-on military or political or diplomatic plans. This was in violation of the red line, right, that Obama had declared the year before that the red line for American military intervention in Iran would be the use of chemical weapons. Well, it turned out they, they probably were used. So, he established the line because he felt it wouldn't have to be crossed, and then it was caught. As British support fell, as congressional support fell, the president, it was clear, with a very bad conscience, was being led to execute a policy he didn't fundamentally believe in. And at the last minute, you may recall, John Kerry is at a press conference in London, and a journalist asked him whether it was arranged or not, I can't be sure. Are there any conditions under which you wouldn't use military force against Assad. And Kerry said, oh, Well, if he, of course, got rid of all of his chemical weapons, well, there would be no reason. But if he's not going to do that. One hour later, one hour later, Kerry got a call, phone call from his Russian counterpart, Sergei Lavrov. He said, John, are you serious? He said, yes, we're serious. Six hours later, Putin got an agreement from Assad saying he agrees to give up his chemical weapons under United States nations inspections. 
by the way, and a remarkable feat of diplomatic jujitsu. Judo, uh, Putin is a judo expert, by the way, uh, to the eighth or ninth degree in black belt. Okay, as a college student, he was the Leningrad city champion. It's a deadly. Um, he was thereby able to take regime change off the agenda of American foreign policy for all practical purposes in a very deft maneuver without any use of force. In May of 2010, uh, yes, about a year after the uh, Obama recess summit, American troops marched in Red Square on Victory Day, May 9th, 2010, for the first time ever. Also the last time. But it was a sign, indeed, that Putin expected there to be consequences to the reorganization of relations that was attempted in the first year of the Obama administration. Keep in mind, in 2013, Russian intelligence alerted the FBI about the Tsarnaev brothers, the Chechen boys, who perpetrated the Boston Marathon massacre. The FBI ignored them. Because what do the Russians know? Incidentally, keep in mind also, you hear a lot in this country about the Russians as um, foes, enemies, adversaries. If you listen to Putin carefully, he almost never refers to the United States in these terms. He invariably refers to the Americans either ironically as our friends, or, more frequently, as our partners. Partnior is the Russian term, from judo. A judo partner. Right? I'll come back to this. I believe this is an important part of the way in which Putin sees the world. Okay? It's an ongoing relationship. You can't have a judo match without a partner. Right? All right. So what are we to make of this? My thesis is that Russia in no way represents a threat to truly vital American interests, as opposed to what we might call vested American interests. That is, interests which we have inherited from the past without necessarily examining the extent to which are they really matters over which the most important issues of the country are concerned or not. That Russia in no way represents a threat to truly vital American interests, as distinct from vested ones, in the way that the Soviet Union did. Or at least the way in which the Soviet Union aspired to. Russian economic and military power is vastly inferior to that of the Soviet Union, while Russia's international objectives under Putin are devoid of any significant international ideological content in the sense of trying to convert the outside world to a Russian model. That's not what Putin's about. He's about defending a Russian model inside Russia. Whereas the Soviet Union, in theory, was about converting the rest of the world to the Soviet model. That's totally absent. And again, unlike the Soviet Union, Russian foreign policy under Putin, its focus is almost entirely regional in nature. Focused on the borderlands of the old Soviet Union and the Russian Empire, as opposed to the global scale. How different from that of the United States. And in this regional focus, Putin's standards are overwhelmingly pragmatic in consideration. Economic influence, political networks, military power. If that's the case, why has there been so much difficulty in trying to establish a stable pattern of American-Russian relations in the now 27-odd years since the end of the Cold War? Particularly, most of you will know in this room who George Kennan was, famous American diplomat and Russian scholar. In 1952, he wrote one of the very few serious pieces ever written during the Cold War, anywhere, 
about the conditions necessary for a stable or at least reasonably normal non-traumatic American-Russian relationship. By the way, you notice the first point is not central to my argument here, but he said the first thing we need to be clear about is what Russia can't be. It can't be a liberal free market democracy because of the weight, the accumulated weight of historical tradition, social structure, political culture, and so on. Okay. It's the second set of points that are crit critical for my purposes. He said that it would be possible to have a reasonably normal relationship with Russia if three conditions were met. Number one, if Russia were to rid itself of its totalitarian political structure. Why? Because he said it required an enemy image of the outside world in order to justify the sacrifices it imposed upon its own people. Well, uh, that condition is met. Putin's Russia is definitely an authoritarian political machine, but it is a far cry from the totalitarian effort to control all aspects of the Russian economy, society, culture, religion, etc. Russians today are essentially free to travel abroad, money being the only issue in 99.9% .9 of the cases. Um, you have, for all intents and purposes, freedom of worship, certainly for Russia's historical religions, Russian Orthodox Christianity, Judaism, Islam, and Buddhism, which are officially protected, incidentally, in, in Putin's Russia. Um, private property is allowed. Of course, the conditions is another question, especially the larger you get, the closer you get involved with the political machine, but it's a far, far cry from the Soviet period. Secondly, Kennan argued that Russia would have to rid itself of communism because the communist project, by definition, makes the rest of the world insecure. Because it posits that communist Russia can only be secure if the rest of the world becomes like it. Right? By the way, notice, that's the mirror image of what we might call the liberal democratic view of the world, right? which is that the United States can only be truly secure, and its value is truly secure, if the rest of the world becomes just like it. Okay? I'll come back to that too. No question, communism is dead in Russia, even though its rulers like Putin were socialized in the communist period. Putin has no truck with the communist economic system. He believes it was a bankrupt ideology. He believed communism as an economic system isolated Russia from the outside world, rendered it uncompetitive, unproductive, much poorer than the country otherwise would have to be. He has a completely unsentimental attitude toward this. When Putin said in 2005, the disintegration of the Soviet Union was the greatest geopolitical tragedy of the 20th century, he was not referring to communism as such. He was referring to Russia as a great power. Russia as a single, large, Eurasian, transcontinental state. All right, so Kennan's second condition has arguably been met. The third condition is more complicated. No empire. Russia must also relinquish its imperial vocation. What did Kennan mean by that? He meant Russia must not try to rule peoples who do not wish to be ruled by Russia and who are able to govern themselves. Okay? I would say that condition is also met, although it's a more complicated argument to make. What Putin wants, the Georgian War in 2008 shows this is not to reconstitute a formal empire in which Russia reincorporates former Soviet states into a Russian polity. That's simply too expensive and too complicated politically and administratively in an era of mass nationalism. That he gets. What he wants, rather, is what he believes the United States has taken for granted from the very beginning of its own existence as an independent state, a sphere of influence in its own regional neighborhood. The Russian term for this, by the way, you probably get it without translation, Monroskaya Doctrina. <laughs> I'll say it in an American accent, then I'll translate it. Monroskaya Doctrina. Um, Monroe Doctrine, Russian style, right? That's what Putin wants. He wants informal empire, not formal empire. So, granting at least part of Kennan's third case, if those conditions have been met, 
Why has it been so difficult to establish a stable pattern of American-Russian relations in the last 27 um, odd years? Indeed, you know, Dr. Karp and I were working together back in New York in the middle of the 1980s at a, <laughs> at a research institute. Well, we did, we did admit minors into the, uh, into the institute at that time. So, um, we remember the atmosphere, and many of you in this room will, in 1984-85, before Gorbachev came to power. Do this thought experiment. Think about where we are in Russian-American relations today. And the consensus point in American politics is, right, nothing can happen until Putin goes. That's basically the consensus point. Democrats and Republicans share this alike. But think about the kind of Russia that exists today under Putin. Go back 30 odd years. What price would the United States have paid to get that kind of Russia today? A lot in 1984. If it's so difficult to accept that kind of Russia, maybe the explanation lies as well in sources of American behavior and, not, and values, and not simply in terms of sources of Russian behavior um, and values. In other words, it's not just that Russia is not a satisfied power. This is true. Russia is not a satisfied international power because it sees itself as a major loser of the end of the Cold War, the way the post-Cold War environment turned out, especially in the form of NATO expansion. We can discuss this in detail in the Q&A period, if you like. There's some very remarkable recent archival evidence that's become available, which tends strongly to sustain the Russian uh, thesis that they were essentially betrayed uh, during the negotiations on German unification. It's not simply that Russia is an unsatisfied power, but it's also perhaps that the United States remains an unsatisfied power. If indeed, as our national security elite seems to think, virtually every issue in every area of the world is of vital interest uh, to the United States. To the extent that that is the case, it means that the United States will continue to be contesting countries like Russia for influence along their immediate historical borderlands. A recipe, it seems to me, for perpetual antagonism in the relationship. Now, the core of my argument for why it's been so difficult to establish a stable pattern of relations in the post-Cold War world between Moscow and Washington is that there is a combination of basic imbalances or asymmetries in the relationship combined with basically incompatible policy objectives that interact with each other to make the political barriers, the political obstacles to stabilization almost insuperable in both Washington and Moscow. I'll go through those in a minute. But even if the relationship were more balanced, the differences in policy objectives would still be hard enough to deal with. And even if the policy objectives were similar, the imbalances in the relationship are so stark that it also poses enormous obstacles to the stabilization of that relationship. Let me give you some details. So, basic power. The United States remains vastly superior to Russia in essentially every aspect of measurable international power. If we just look at the Russian economy, if we convert the uh, ruble economy into dollar values, which it, it, will, it will exaggerate certain negative features inside Russia in living standards, but it's accurate for the country's international economic weight. Okay. The dollarized value of the Russian economy today is one-fourteenth that of the United States. In other words, the U.S. economy is 14 times bigger than the Russian economy. When you add NATO Europe, Japan to that, you are going to more than double that disparity. Okay. So, just to give you an idea of that basic fundamental um, asymmetry. Um, there is, therefore, simply very little objective basis for American leaders to acknowledge what Russian leaders insist 
as the basis of the relationship. You should treat us as equals. Why should we? The United States never agreed to treat Moscow as an equal during the Cold War. Why should it agree to do so now? As long as Washington refuses to re-examine that attitude, there is going to be a perpetual source of frustration uh, and of friction uh, built into the very structure, substructure of the relationship. Um, second point, focus. America's foreign policy focus is global, if you can say it has a global focus. There's a, a chart of uh, military bases, major facilities around, not all of them, <coughs> something like 180 major bases in almost as many countries around the world. Russia has won outside the boundaries of the former Soviet Union. It's in Syria. It was inherited from the Soviet Union, which established it in 1970. <coughs> U.S. focus is global. Russia's focus is regional. The U.S. is simply much more important for Russia than Russia is for the United States. That's an objective fact. Whatever the merits of individual issues in the relationship are. The result is a virtual absence of substantive dialogue between Washington and Moscow about the direction of the relationship each uh, finds himself moving toward. And the result, in, in the absence of that conversation, when crises inevitably break out like they did over Ukraine, you see default zero-sum reflexes uh, 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 predominating in each capital. Another illustration of this difference in focus. So this is the reset button that uh, Hillary Clinton, as Secretary of State, gave to her Russian counterpart, Sergei Lavrov, in uh, spring of 2009. Some of you probably have heard of it. There were two mistakes. The first was a linguistic one. It says Peregruska, but they forgot Z-A between Pere and Gruska. And if you forget that in Russian, it means overburden instead of uh, reset or reload. Yeah, it means the exact opposite, actually, of what you intended to mean. Right? But that's not the most serious mistake. You don't even need to know Russian to see the most serious mistake. Even if Perry Gruska was correct, it's written in Latin letters, not Cyrillic. The Russians don't use the Latin alphabet. Now, it may be a trivial example. To me, it has semiotic or symbolic significance, right? This could never have happened in the Cold War. It, this would have gone through so many layers of review. I happen to know who did this. I'm not going to name, name names. It's embarrassing, right? It could never have gone, happened in the Cold War. Right? It reflects the relative importance each assigns to the relationship, right? This is basically Americans talking to themselves for photo ops at home has not to do with the substance of the relationship. Okay. So, asymmetries in basic power, asymmetries in focus, asymmetries in values, right? I don't think that needs very much elaboration. Um, Russia opposes American democracy promotion as a cover for containing Russia and promotes itself a traditionalist social ethos against an allegedly libertine postmodern West. Meanwhile, American opposition to Putin's Russia now has an unassailable broad bipartisan base, including almost all liberal Democrats as well as conservative Republicans, really for the first time, at least since the 40s and 50s. And, it turns out, Repeated public American criticism of Putin only reinforces Putin's standing at home, which the last I looked is at 82%. We'll come back later about what that 82% means. So, and by the way, this is not some short term phenomenon. This is a political cartoon from 1900. Okay? And you see the savage Russian bear with the crown of monarchy, right? Underneath a gold gulf of Siberia with a double-headed vulture, right, symbolizing the Byzantine double-headed eagle, which is part of the Russian emblem of state, 
And then you see Russian political refugees clinging at the trousers of Uncle Sam while the Statue of Liberty beckons in the background, right? <coughs> These are tropes that precede the Putin period. They precede even the Soviet period. I recall when Tully and I were preparing to get married in the Catholic Church in the uh, winter of 87. And the priest invoked, may the Virgin Mary return to Russia. And I'm saying to myself, as a trained Soviet scholar, come on, stick, stick to religion, right? And then I realized what he was talking about. He wasn't talking about Soviet atheism versus religion. He was talking about the Catholic Virgin Mary returning to heathen Orthodox Christian Russia because that is a vision of Our Lady of Fatima, 1916, in Portugal, before the Russian Revolution. So, these tropes have much deeper roots. They go back into religion, the split between East, the Eastern and Western churches. They have to do with the patterns of emigration from Russia, where most of the Russian diaspora is anti-Russian. Okay? If you look at the ethnic groups that populate, either on ethnic grounds or on political grounds. Very different from the Chinese diaspora in the United States. Almost the exact opposite effect. So values also massively uh, divide and reinforce uh, tension in the relationship. Memory. Americans and Russians simply don't agree on what happened. Most Americans believe still, honestly, that the 1990s was a noble enterprise, a period in which the U.S. sought to transform Russia into a functioning market democracy. For most Russians who had to live through that period, this was a cat catastrophe of the first magnitude. The industrial economy collapsed by more than 50%, twice as large as during the Great Depression in the United States and Germany. Right? Um, entire classes of middle class professionals were wiped out. The life savings of well over 90% of the population were wiped out with consequences like this. Male life expectancy by 1994 had fallen to below 58 years old, right? That's how almost all Russians see what happened in the 1990s, domestically while NATO is also beginning to expand at Russia's expense, internationally. The Americans have a fundamentally different frame on what those 90s were about. And that also divides them. So, huge, mutually reinforcing asymmetries or imbalances in power, in focus, in values, in memory. And there's one other item which ironically is actually quite imbalanced an imbalance. That's trade. But at such a low level that it cannot possibly act as a shock absorber in the relationship. In the way that it does, for example, with Chinese-American relations today. Take a look at the list here. U.S. trade with China and Canada. $577, $543 billion last year. 2016. With the Netherlands, 55 billion. With Russia, 20 billion. And Foreman, by the way. So there are simply too few stakeholders, economic stakeholders in the relationship, that when crises and conflicts occur, which they inevitably do amongst great states, there simply aren't there in a sufficient quantity or with the political networks to compel re-examination of positions in the way that almost automatically now happens with U.S.-China relations. Because of the enormously complex set of economic, trade, investment, and financial interdependencies on both sides. So, beyond these structural factors, there's also the policy question, right? Um, A, the general assumption underlying U.S. policy. And here, Joe Biden was maybe closer to Dick Cheney than he knew, 
when he said in the immediate aftermath of the Obama summit in July of 2009 about Russia, I think, quote, we vastly underestimate the hand we hold. In other words, for Biden, all these indices of superior American power basically will translate into a Russia that has to follow America's lead, almost independently of the particular issue. But for Russians, the point of most concern was that the Americans consistently denied Russia a sphere of influence along its historical borderlands. So long as countries like Ukraine and Georgia remain eligible for NATO membership, which they do and have been since April of 2008, Moscow cannot assume that it can provide for its regional security at the negotiating table with Washington. Such a framework, in my judgment, can help explain why Putin would have taken the risky decision to interfere in the 2016 presidential elections. Why did he do it? In my judgment, it was not in order to elect Donald Trump. How could Putin, a self-styled realist, have thought ever that Trump had a reasonable chance of winning? How many in this room thought that Trump had a reasonable chance of winning, say, in June of 2016, when key decisions in Moscow would have to have been made? How could he have thought that when all of the expertise in the United States, much of it being channeled back to Moscow, held it to be an inevitability that Hillary Clinton would be the next president? You know, I ran into Larry Sabato a couple of months after the election. We were next to a neighbors for a while. And uh, Larry had given Hillary 323 electoral votes in his uh, crystal ball. And I put my arm around Larry. I said, Larry, don't feel too bad. You're still 47 votes ahead of the Democratic National Committee. Because they were behaving as if they were going to get 370. When you look at how they allocated resources, OK? It's clear. That's how confident they were. And Larry told me, he said, Alan, you have no idea. I got a call from the DNC the Friday before the election saying I was going to wake up Wednesday morning with egg all over my face because I only gave Hillary 323 votes. OK? He also told me that in the afternoon of election day, just after the first exit polls came out, he got a telephone call from Miss Kellyanne Conway, who said, Larry, we're going to be wiped out. OK? We're going to be wiped out. Now, Putin definitely has a record of taking risks for major stakes. But unlike Khrushchev, they're carefully planned with trying to make the probabilities as maximum as possible. I find nothing in Putin's record to tell me that he would take this kind of a risk for the improbability of helping Donald Trump become president of the United States. Rather, it was based on the almost certainty that Hillary Clinton would become president of the United States to, and given that he had lost all expectations for improvement in the relationship, especially since Clinton had publicly berated Putin in 2011 for clearly manipulated Russian parliamentary elections, he had become extremely personal. And Clinton admits in her latest memoir that Putin had it in for her from that point, and she's right about that. Right? My judgment is, to the extent that Putin was involved in the decision to intervene, it was not to elect Trump, but to foment so much embarrassment about the American political system, American democracy, and so forth, as to neutralize what he expected would be a full court press against his system. Remember, he's coming up for re-election uh, in March. And press pressure against his client, client states along Russia's borderlands. That is a stake that Putin uh, could take risks for but not for the improbability of electing Donald Trump. Um, there was little reason for Putin uh, to disagree, uh, to think that Clinton disagreed, rather, with President Obama 
keep in mind, in um, October of 2014, President Obama stated in public that there were three main threats facing the United States of America. Number one, Ebola. But what do you do with Ebola? You eradicate it. Number two, ISIS. What do you do with ISIS? You annihilate it. And number three, Russia. <laughs> Fill in the blank. Okay? So, my argument is based not on a projection of internal American politics onto Putin's motives, but rather looking at Putin's motives in the longer context of where the relationship between Washington and Moscow was going. Right? This says nothing about what the Trump campaign motives may have been. I'm not a specialist on American politics. <laughs> it's, it's my reading of Russian motives in this respect. You may wind up getting Trump on many other things, but I do not believe you're going to get him on specific electoral collusion with Putin for the election, because I do not believe that's what Putin was about. So if you do have partisan interests here, at least consider that and factor it into your own calculations. That's as far as I'll go. Um, I'll also note, you know, this was not a terribly demanding operation. The password that John Podesta had, John Podesta was the chairman of the Democratic National Committee, the password on his uh, Windows 8 operating system was P, uh, it wasn't password, because Google doesn't allow you to use password for password. So instead, he used P ampersand SSW0RD. Okay? And then, by clicking the wrong key, because his A told him that this, this phishing letter was legitimate instead of illegitimate, he made a typo. Yes. He, he sent it to the whole world. So, I think any of us with one of my IT guys, you know, probably even in the school, could probably figure out how to crack that system under those circumstances. Okay. It was a very low lying target. Very easy. Consider also, the Democratic National Committee was informed by the FBI in September of 2015 that its systems were likely being hacked. September of 2015, before anybody was thinking of Trump as a serious candidate. Anyone. Anyway. So, the involvement was not triggered by Trump. The involvement was triggered by Clinton, in my judgment. Moreover, if you look at the pattern at which um, resources were, were allocated, it turns out that um, the Facebook ads, for example, there was about $1,000 total spent in Michigan and Wisconsin put together. Half of the hits came after Trump was elected. This does not suggest a carefully calibrated campaign to influence a specific outcome of the election. It's rather a blunderbuss approach to create confusion, embarrassment, and to neutralize, after all, what the United States has always said is one of its arsenals of soft power, right? Democratization, human rights, which Putin sees as containment of him and of Russia. Okay, so we're coming up to the time. Um, conclusions. Do we have reason to be afraid? Yes. But I would say the fear ha should have less to do with Russia or Putin per se than with the state of America's relationship with Russia and vice versa. Especially when one or both parties seem to have almost nothing to hope for and perhaps even nothing to fear from. That's a situation to be fearful of. Secondly, but this has more to do with the manner of interaction with Moscow and Washington rather than Russia or Putin per se. Insofar as the default tendency of the US national security class seems to be to regard almost every international issue as of vital importance to itself, there may well be cause to fear ourselves as well, or at least the ways in which the projection of our own interests and values 
abroad can induce insecurity in others. After all, the United States occupies a position on the world stage that the American founders fear the American government at home. Virtually unchecked authority and the tendency of even the most virtuous or self-styled virtuous to seek absolute power. Should we really be surprised when many abroad fear the overweening power of the U.S. government in the manner that so many of our co-citizens do of our own government at home, of left or right? Something else to be fearful of. If you were to ask me, okay, Alan, what's, what's your basic Russia policy? What would your preferred Russian policy would be? Well, it's something like this. Number one, we need to proceed from the, the realization that Putin is a reasonably effective leader. Number two, it would be a good thing if Russian-American relations got better. Number three, the United States bears its share of responsibility for the collapse of the relationship. Number four, that given uh, our very difficult record with democracy promotion and regime change, especially in the last 15 years, we might want to think about whether we want to make that essential part of our a diplomatic engagement with countries like Russia. All right. You might agree, you might disagree with that, but at least it's a defensible position. It's also Trump's position. That was his position. Might be putting a little bit of lipstick on the pig, but that was his position. Okay? He would express it a little differently, but in substance, that was his position. As soon as Trump announces it, he is universally opposed. What's to be fearful here? You've all seen it, I'm sure, in your social and, and business and professional lives. Somebody who becomes so odious that people oppose him even when he's right. Right? Yes. This is the irony that faces Putin now. Having intervened with the expectation that Hillary Clinton would win, and being pleased but amazed that Trump won, he finds out that his record of intervention now guarantees there cannot be an improvement in American-Russian relations indefinitely. Because the Congress has seized control of Trump's Putin policy. In March, Putin actually introduced a confidential initiative to try and reset the relationship. It was strangulated in the crib within one week inside the national security bureaucracy in Washington. You probably haven't even heard of it. In July, the Congress voted virtually unanimously in both houses sanctions legislation that prevents the president from lifting sanctions against Moscow without Congress's prior approval. Keep in mind, President Obama imposed sanctions by executive authority, which meant they could be lifted by executive authority. The Congress, his own party, distrusted Trump so much that they voted with the Democrats to basically tie his hands on that policy, which means that now Putin is boxed out in the relationship in this respect. Last point. This is something you never hear. The truth is that the United States does have a vital interest in a strong Russian state. That is to say, a Russian government that is able to exercise effective command and control of the accumulated nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons infrastructure inherited from the old Soviet Union and being developed since then. The history of the past 27 years has shown, since the collapse of the Soviet Union, that the half-life of highly enriched uranium and plutonium was a lot longer than the half-life of states and civilizations. Whether it's Putin, or some Democrat, or some other leader. And this concerns not just Russia, it concerns every nuclear power in the world, including the United States. We all have an interest in trying to insulate what the Russians call that archipelago of weapons of mass destruction from the inevitable instabilities of politics in the here and now. Uh, but we are so gripped by fear of our image of Putin and our inability to think in terms of relationships that we haven't even begun um, to grapple with the implications of that challenge.
I'll stop there. I know uh, then we're going to probably take a break. We'll come back. Thank Questions? You. Okay. Uh, so that's it. Thank you very much.